Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Will Terry, and Lee White is not with us today because our third point perspective is Travis Hansen. Travis Hansen. And this uh, was such a good interview. I got so many little nuggets of of like oh i gotta change this i gotta work on that i gotta do better here the guy is is incredible travis hansen lives in southern california you might know him as the creator of the bean which is one of the earliest web comics online he started that in 1999 um and uh you could find his go to his website beanleafpress.com and also check him out on instagram travis j Hanson um, on Instagram, and it's H-A-N-S-O-N, not E-N. I put in the wrong Hanson, and I got some guy in Florida. So you want the you want the, the cartoonist in, in California. <laughs> uh, what did you think of the interview, Will? We just got done with it. It was great. Um, probably my biggest takeaway and the takeaway that I'm hoping that you guys listening take away as well is... Travis is one of those people who just decided that he was going to have an art career Mm -hmm. and he didn't wait to be picked. He Mm -hmm. went directly at it and made it happen. Mm -hmm. And it's inspirational because I truly believe that if you are um, committed, you don't even have to be the most talented, but if you're committed, and I'm not saying anything about his talent level in in that comment, Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I'm saying uh, you work into it. And, um, you, you, we live in a day and age where you don't have to rely on someone else giving you a job. And it's interesting because I know that we've all been programmed that way. Mm -hmm. Right. And the biggest question that I get asked as an illustrator is how do I get work? In other words, Mm -hmm. how does someone else Mm -hmm. give me a job? Right. And my biggest takeaway from Travis is he gave himself a bunch of jobs he yeah. employed himself. Mm-hmm. So it's truly self-employed. We, we say that people that do client work are self-employed. Mm-hmm. And really, they have lots of different employers. Well, and the, yeah, and the irony is the, the more he worked for himself, the more clients started uh, right. you know, asking him <laughs> for work. And are you available? And are you doing stuff? And now that's, you know, he, he spends... It was just cool to talk him talking about like his day, his daily schedule. He gives yeah. time for service, time for family, and then time for himself, his own projects. And then he has an afternoon of, of client work to do as well. So uh, I think my big takeaway too from this was the importance of, of multiple revenue streams as an illustrator. The mm-hmm. This is a guy who's had a 30 year career so far, or 30 years, I don't know, close to that. He's 51, yeah. he's he's been doing it since 19. Yeah, 30 years plus. Yeah. So um, uh, he's been around the block. He's seen the ebb and flow of, of industries and he's, he's stayed afloat the whole time. And it's because he's, he doesn't have one source of, of, of revenue coming in. It's spread out on, on these, all these things. So cool interview. Let's quit wasting your time and get right down into it. Uh, everybody here is... Travis Hansen. So Travis, thanks for uh, joining us today. We, this was actually Will who put this together. I think you and Will have more of a, a history as we have history. Yeah. We go history. way back. Well, to tell the con me where, days. Where, where do you where guys cons <laughs> con men? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Travis, how do you know Will? I met Will at a show. I think years ago we were just talking and, uh, just kind of connected. I don't even remember when it was. It's, just, it's kind of like I've always known Will. <laughs> Probably in 2017. <laughs> Might have been. Is that when you started doing the cons? Yeah. Yeah. So it was 2017 when I when we met. And did he come up to you and, and was like, "What is going on here?" Or I don't remember what? how we connected. We just I kept kind passing of... you going to the bathroom, and oh. I felt the need to explain why I was going to the bathroom so often. <laughs> That's no, I probably <laughs> it. I... <laughs> How could you forget that? <laughs> so, okay, let's let's start there. Um, 
Comic Cons. You are a, a, a comic artist, essentially. Um, you do illustration work as well. And that's really what kind of interests me about your work. When I look at your work, I see obvious like newspaper comic style influence, but your your subject matter is fantasy and like very rich, uh, fantastic storytelling. That and and I would say more of your like um, panel layouts and stuff feel more like traditional comics. So it's this weird. No, I wouldn't say weird. It's this kind of like this unique hybrid between what you might see in, in you know, I guess there aren't newspaper comics anymore, but what you might see in the Sunday newspaper 20 years ago <laughs> and what you might see cracking open uh, a comic book today. So comics, I would say, is is your thing. How did you get into that? And and how did you how do you make it work as a career essentially? And I have a feeling Comic Cons have a, play a key role in there because I've seen you, I think at every Comic Con I've ever gone to. <laughs> well, well I, I I do a lot more than just comics. And the one thing that if you're going to work for yourself, it's learning how to um, create multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about comics is is one day that stream dries up and you've got to be able to have something else in the in the hopper to, to mm -hmm. keep it going. So I, I like to look at myself more as an illustrator who plays in all these different genres and has a, a blast with it. I mean, I'm doing a ton of game art right now. In fact, I'm starting my fifth monster manual for another company. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll take me, you know, two months, three months to get done. And then I've got several children books in the work and then a couple other books. Um, I, I was lucky enough. Uh, yeah, I grew up in reading newspaper comics. I can remember when Calvin Hobbes came out. I was a big fan of Boone County. My brother and I would fight over the newspaper so we could cut them out and put them in our own little boulder binders with plastic so that we could protect them. And, <laughs> and uh, this is before they were making them as books. And uh, so I've always been a fan of, of the newspaper. And that's what I always wanted to do. But then in the 90s, I noticed that the newspapers were dying uh, because of the internet. And so I actually got into internet comics, uh, in 99, in the very beginning, uh, with Bean, And, uh, mm. and that actually 11 years later got nominated for an Eisner, uh, in web comics. So I think well, web so comics is like a doorway. Um, so I, I'm just trying to, how, what age, like, how old are you? Uh, how old do I <laughs> if you don't mind, if you don't mind telling, <laughs> how old do uh, I 30, 36. <laughs> no, I actually, I'm 51. 51. Okay. So I, I'm just trying to place that because just for context for people. I was born know, in 71. So I'm definitely, a, I'm definitely a child of the eighties. Child of, yeah. And that, and it's funny. You said that about clipping out the comics. I have a stack of, of, uh, Calvin Hobbes comics over there that I trimmed out of the newspaper because I couldn't wait for the books to come out. <laughs> well, I mean, I still have art books that are National Geographic's that I, you know, cut the pictures out that I wanted and put in the, these thick art books. I still have those. <laughs> like and I still uh, use yeah. them for reverence. That's um, amazing. You know, the cool thing is, 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 I mean, I can remember also, uh, that's when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. I play, you know, 80, 83, I was playing the red box, colored my own dice. What's funny is I learned at church because uh, <laughs> everyone says, oh, that was the era that, ooh, bad, but not really. <laughs> you know, on, on the West Coast, we didn't really care. We just, you, you, you hid because you didn't want to get labeled as a geek, but that was just <laughs> about it. And then, uh, <laughs> but when I hit... Uh, when I started doing the web comics, I realized what a, an untapped avenue to get your name out there, especially when, an, as an indie creator, uh, I mean, you had great influences. You had Richard and Wendy Penny, who was mm -hmm. doing ElfQuest. You had Bone by Jeff Smith. You had um, Hero Bear and the Kid by Mike Kunkel. You had all these great black and whites coming out. And, and yet you had to go through your options were limited for distribution. You mm -hmm. had to either get picked up by Dark Horse or you had to go through one of five distribution options. And it was really non-effective. Whereas when we started doing an internet comic, 
all of a sudden, you know, you're giving this comic away for free. And my audience jumped all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't just limited to a, an area where a newspaper would be. It, it was an international audience. And then by the time I hit, what was it, 2012 is when I started producing the bean through Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had figured out a whole new way to publish and get stuff out and, and hit that international audience. Now, I don't use Kickstarter much anymore for, for publishing because I have found that with international shipping, it kind of kills you. Um, mm -hmm. They keep raising that. So I found another avenue to make it work. But then I, when I'm going to do my Kickstarter, I'll do it as a game or something. I'll use it just to have fun. But, you know, after 11 of them, that just wears you out. Can you mm -hmm. clarify a little bit on the, the, the international shipping? Are you saying that because Kickstarter takes 10% that? No, 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 no. It's because the USPS decided to raise their shipping rates to be astronomical. It's really right. pushing people, small business out of the shipping market. Um, oh, so you're not like, shipping international on your own either. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, we would ship through USPS. Uh, you know, so let's say you bought a comic in Australia and now you just right. paid 20 bucks for that book. Now you got to pay another 20 bucks for me to ship it to you. Right. Well, nowadays, <laughs> nowadays it's fifty dollars to ship. So right. what's right. the I've incentive? Been through it. What's the incentive to buy outside of the US? when you have to pay triple the price just for that one book of a creator that you like. So when we switch to um, Kindle Direct Publishing, now um, you buy it in Australia, you get it for prime shipping. Oh, gotcha. Mm. Okay. And it doesn't cost me a dime. I don't have to worry about it. They handle everything. Gotcha. And we're moving about 100 books a month through them right now. It just keeps growing. That's Do you can, can Can you talk about that a little bit? Do you have to join... Um, their program where they price your book? No, no, they no. Control it. So well, the way KDP works is is you now you either buy your ISBN number or you can use one of theirs. If you use one of theirs, you're under their control a little bit more. When you use your own ISBN number, that's your control. The ISBN number is the number on the back with the barcode right. for for registration purposes. Now the way it works is I upload a book. It goes onto the Amazon system. Amazon says, okay, it's going to cost this much for us to produce. So let's say the book is $750. Now, if you price the book at $25, you're going to get approximately $750 back, mm -hmm. which to me was like, oh, dude, that's a lot better than 10% back from a publisher. Oh, yeah. Right. And yeah. the thing about a publisher and having gone that route as well, you get paid usually a year later if you're lucky. Right. And payment is based on after everything is paid off. And then, and that's kind of where it gets a little fuzzy when they go, oh yeah, we paid for these advertising costs. And well, I never right. saw that, you know, <laughs> right. I never approved that. But um, with Amazon, now you can do your own, you, you do your own pushing and stuff like that, but you get a royalty check each month. Mm. So yeah, so that payment comes through monthly. So now, so now I'm making probably forty to sixty percent on a book because I priced it where I wanted the MSRP to be, mm -hmm. and I'm in total control over what's happening. I can take it to another printer if I wanted. I can reprint it because I use my own ISBN numbers, but mm -hmm. I'm using Amazon's system to manufacture and ship my books, and it doesn't cost me anything. So they're and printing your book too. Oh yeah, they print my book, and then I can buy. The books for shows um, at the printing cost, which is about seven twenty a book, because my books are about a hundred pages and they're big and stuff like that in mm -hmm. full color. But it, it you can run the whole gamut of pricing. You can really they have tons of different options. And I found out to be all of a sudden now. Here's the kicker: my wife was totally excited because she's no longer shipping books. We mm -hmm. don't have stock sitting in the garage. Mm -hmm. You know, I just buy what I need, and right. then and then. At the end, you know, the tax guy doesn't bug me because of it, because I no longer have inventory sitting that counts against me. Um, so, I mean, it's just I think for an independent creator, it's really going to open the doors. I've got several friends on it now to make it work, though, is you can't just do one book. One book honestly only has a lifespan of about three months, four months, maybe. Mm -hmm. So the more books you put on there, 
the better your options are because someone's now buying four books or five books, or if they find you now and they realize, oh my gosh, he's got seven other books out. I'm going to go back and buy those. That's where it starts to build up and the mm-hmm. royalties really become worth it. When did you switch to that? March. Oh, just this year. Just this year. I released seven books in four months. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, uh, and these were books that you had already previously published no. and now no, you're these are, them on these were just, these are these were just the comics from Life of the Party. Oh, okay. Now, okay. I'm gonna, now Bean got picked up by a publisher. And so we go through a whole nother thing for that. And I'm fine with that. Mm-hmm. But Life of the Party, I still want to control the IP um, aggressively. And so, you know, the thing that I didn't like about Kickstarter is I'd launch a Kickstarter, I'd run it. I'd have to wait like six or seven months to finish the fulfillment of it. And I never felt that I could launch another Kickstarter until Mm. I got everything taken care of. Now, meanwhile, Mm. I've got books that are piling up ready to print, but Mm. when you're a one man show trying to run a full Kickstarter and you're bringing in 70 to 80,000 at that time, and you've got like 1700 people that you've got to set the backing up and all the little tidbits and, and extras and stuff like that, you put yourself in a really rough, um, emotional position where mm-hmm. it drains you. You're not working on anything else. You're trying to get all the right. Kickstarter done. And that weight is just like building and building and building on you. Mm. Yeah, I feel so, like you are my therapist right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm sitting here going, because because uh, when you, you know, I mean, obviously you know this, but when you, you have this, the stragglers that didn't um, fill out their survey, so you have a backlog of those people trickling in as well, saying, where's my book? But they don't really know how it works. So they didn't. They yeah, didn't the stragglers, the updates. I give them opportunities. But after two or three years, I mean, I can't hold on for you. Yeah. Right. I, there, there needs to be a, like a statue of limitations for. <laughs> for <laughs> no, I mean, if someone reaches out to me and they send me an email, say, hey, we did this and it's closed now. Can we get our stuff? Yeah, I'll hook you up. I don't mm-hmm. care. You know, you, you do your best to to be the nice guy. But the cool thing about having KDP now is I don't even have to be the nice guy. KDP handles all that. So right. if there's an issue, they're the ones that replace the book. And they're very generous. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll take care of you and, and stuff. So it works out very well for me. That just allows me to create, which is what I want. And then they can focus more on the distribution, end, which is something that I don't want to deal with at the moment. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So these books that KDP is is making, what, what's their quality like? Do you have? Dang do you have good. One there? Uh, hold on, let me find it. Yeah. Uh, I, I Jake, like your you shirt, and I by are, the way. <laughs> Jake and I are just taking notes. This has turned into more than a podcast. It's like it's about us doing research right now. <laughs> okay, hold so on. that so is. So, oh, it's, it's, it's just a little on focus. There, there we go. There you, so yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. You know, that so is, if, you, if you join us on YouTube, go to Society of Visual Storytelling to see what we're looking at right now. Yeah, yeah. he's holding up a book. It's it's what what size would you say? Eight and a half. By this 11? one, this is actually um, eight by eleven. And then when I'm doing the actual full color comics, comics. So these are all the single panels, mm-hmm. and I got five volumes worth of single panels. I think I can get one more out, and then that'll be it of the singles. But then when I started doing the the serial based, the more of the campaign based comics, I actually built the size a little bigger so it's kind of like eight by 11 so instead of eight by 10 so you get an extra inch and it allows me to pull it out just a little bit so yeah. the quality is i'm happy with the quality I, you know the one thing that i think uh, another artist actually is the one that got me onto this mm-hmm. and so that's why i did it was to, to test it out and then i i loved it so much so i'm like oh dude i'm jumping all over this now i've got four other friends that are doing this because they can get their entire backlog back out Mm-hmm. for people to find them. And it's just opening up a, a passive stream of income that we don't have to worry about as long as we just post on our social media, hey, we've got something here and we've got another one here and, you know, new book or just remind you. And it's just simple reminding people that it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and, and what about the people that hate Amazon though? Well, so here's what I explain. And I use it this way. You can hate Amazon all you want, you know. But I go, when I go to a, but you want to support indie publishers, you want to support indie creators, you really like to help these artists out. So I go, when I go to a store, let's say I'm in Barnes and Noble, or let's say I go through a big publisher and 
I get less than 10% and I have to wait a year to a year and a half to make any money on that book. And that big publisher is spending more time making money for them off my art than I am. And knock it off. And then, uh, <laughs> sorry. But, but they're making okay. all this money on me. And I'm not making a dime for forever. Now with Amazon, now you tell me who's the big bad guy. Amazon says, hey, we'll publish everything. We'll ship it. We'll distribute it. And we'll give you 40 to 60% back on a monthly basis and you don't have to worry about. So who's really caring for the little creator? It is not the publisher and it's not the bookstore. As much as I love bookstores and comic book stores and stuff like that, I know that the artist or the creator or the writer is getting just pennies on the book. Whereas with Amazon, I'm getting dollars on the book. Mm-hmm. It's that's, that's true. And it's a so, compelling argument. That's for sure. And so yeah. I let them figure out it on their own. I go, look, you can research KDP, you can see how it works. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you choose, if you want to support the small creator, find the creator's page on Amazon and support them. Otherwise, right. continue not, you know, continue. So do you, just I noticed you I know you have a shop, um, mm-hmm. an online shop. Do you still? Oh yeah, still I still use it? that. Oh yeah, because okay. I, I, I do mugs and stuff like that, and I mm-hmm. do other things, and I like to control how it comes out. I'm really picky on on what my product looks like, mm-hmm. so I keep the store just for that. Um, but with the books, it's all new books. I think I'm just going to push through Amazon. I'll keep the prints on the store and some of the other stuff, but it's just okay, so. It's just another stream of income. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I get that, and and that's I love that you opened with it, with that. Like I'm an illustrator, and it's you have to have all of these sort mm-hmm. of table legs underneath your table. So if one gets kicked out, your table doesn't fall over. That's that's the way I've heard it before. You so w- you don't see yourself ever doing a, another Kickstarter again. Oh no no, I see myself doing a Kickstarter. But if I'm going to do a Kickstarter, it's going to be one that I'm going to be totally excited about. You know, mm-hmm. when you do 11 Kickstarters all based on books, you're using the system to become a publisher. You're just like, oh, boom, 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 boom. And there's nothing right. wrong with that. I've got friends that do that and they do very well, but they have mm-hmm. a group of people that work with them too. So they've got this whole army of, of, of underlings that help them fulfill, get the fulfillment done and everything else. All, mm-hmm. My underlings, all my kids, they're all grown. So I've <laughs> lost my, I've lost my uh, support system here, but um it, what I want to use Kickstarter though for is is more of I want to do a game for Life of the Party or I mm-hmm. want to do figurines, something where I know I have to go overseas to get the product, something mm-hmm. that won't clog the books up because it's separate from the books. It might tie into the theme, into the title and everything else, but it's separate. So then I don't feel the guilt of going, oh, I released two more books now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, So that'll allow me to it's just another avenue for me to, to play with. I think Kickstarter is fantastic. And when mm-hmm. used right, I think it's, it's awesome. Unfortunately, there's a lot of big corporations that use Kickstarter, which is, you know, their prerogative. I can't say no to that or not, but they do at times give Kickstarter a bad name. They start to push out the little creators that are mm-hmm. the ones that Kickstarter was originally built for. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to kind of dig into the, the, the other side of that coin and that's your, the marketing side for what you're mm-hmm. doing. You, you talked about staying active on social media. You have your website that, that you use as well. Um, uh, what is it? The bean, beanleafpress.com. Do you have another website or is that? Actually, I'm on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, which I think is noise. I'm on, mm-hmm. um, I'm on deviant art, which, which I had walked away from for a while. And then I looked back and realized, Holy cow, I've got tons of people that are talking on deviant. Um, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Patreon, I'm on all these different platforms. My, my, my philosophy is be on as many platforms as you want. Uh, mm-hmm. The more platforms you are, the more people find you. Now, mm-hmm. it's also how do you use these platforms wisely? And I think there's an issue that creators run into is they bring in their personal feelings into a mm-hmm. platform and they start you know, yelling or complaining or this sucks or you know, they'll blacklist another creator or whatever. And that's not what I'm using the platform for my platform. When I'm on Facebook, I'm using it for like, Hey, this is what I, this is the new piece I'm printing. 
if I'm going to talk politics, I'm going to talk it in my own social circle. And mm-hmm. I just leave it at that. And my social circle is usually my family, maybe a couple mm-hmm. of people that I that I hang out with out here. But the rest of the world, shoot, they have no idea where I sit in my social ideas. And that's mm-hmm. because, um, you know, the one group thinks I'm one way, the one group thinks I'm the other way. And then in reality, I'm just somewhere in the middle. I'm just kind of like, yeah, but I'm using it more for how can I create a little bit of light? How can I create a little bit of happiness? How can I create something that's given away for free? And people can come to my place, regardless of what background you are, what your belief system is, and go, I feel comfortable here. So that's the only reason why I use Facebook or social media the way I do, is to just create a safe spot. And then because of it, I get tons of work, lots of commissions, lots of art comes through there, lots of new projects. Um, that's how I found almost all of my game art. And mm-hmm. I, I find it to be an incredibly positive avenue if you use it as a positive way right um, i have found creators though destroy themselves and and go oh i'm done with facebook or i'm done with uh, instagram or i'm done with this because they they like to bring in all their politics and sometimes their politics are are their own which is which is totally okay but there's probably better avenues that they can get their politics out because usually when someone posts a a, a post where it is more of this is what I believe and you're wrong or whatever. Or this sucks. You get about three or four hits and that's about it. And it's usually your fan base is, that is, you know, the people that are like, oh, yeah, I support you. Yeah, right on, right on. <laughs> but when I post a piece of art, I can get anywhere from 200 to 700 hits. Right. And then are I you get taking shared, notes, Will? And then I get shared. I'm wondering what his politics are. You can I, air them here. <laughs> I'm not going to air them here, <laughs> but, but, you know, there's a chance to share and mm-hmm. there's a chance to, to go, Hey, look, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. How do well, we figure out how to kind of get along? And you as a, as a creator, you also use your storytelling as a platform yeah. to share a message as well. Yeah. Like, it doesn't mean, I mean, that's the good yeah. thing about being a comic artist is, you know, who was it? Someone was saying the most dangerous person in the entire world is the cartoonist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a good point, right? And it's because we see something however we choose to see it, and we draw mm-hmm. that image out. And we didn't write a discourse, or we didn't write mm-hmm. anything else. We just drew one little image, and that image is easier to share than the discourse. Right. And easier to interpret and understand. Yeah. And, 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 and there's different levels. So some people only see one level of the cartoon, which is mm-hmm. great. You know, they're like, oh, that's cute. Another person sees a deeper level. And then finally, mm-hmm. someone will see the level that I want them to see. Right. And, you know, where's the anger coming from or where's the emotion coming from? And, and I think it's important to put your emotion into your art. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but I think that that artist have such a powerful tool of mm-hmm. of directing people yeah. opinions. Well, you cut your teeth and, and were raised on Calvin and Hobbes and, and Bloom County, right? And, oh, and- I was totally cut my teeth on that. I mean, I can remember the the Garfield books when Garfield was fat and ugly before Jim Davis refined him. <laughs> <laughs> but like those, con- I, I don't know about Garfield, but like Calvin and Hobbes. Bill Watterson definitely had a worldview that he, oh, he had an shared extremely, through that strip. He and, had an incredible worldview. Right. And, and Berkeley uh, Breath was the exact opposite. Right. Right. <laughs> right. In fact, and, to see the comics, they have comics between them that show their opinions of each other. Like mm-hmm. Bill Watterson thought Berkeley Breath was a sellout. And, <laughs> and Bill thought that... Uh, or at Berkeley thought otherwise of Calvin. So <laughs> right, right. That's cool. So um how do you have time to do all the social media stuff? So I give myself in the morning, I say, okay, um I'm gonna dedicate at least 15 minutes to my social media in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I make sure I do my post. Today, um, I apologize to all my artists, but I haven't done my post yet because I was <laughs> sleeping. But I'll post right. after the show. But uh, the, the I, I just is- want to interject there for context. Um, he, uh, Travis just got back from a 15 hour drive. It should have been a 12 hour drive, but it was a 15 hour drive due to complications. I feel, um, oh, yeah. So I'm he's 25 yeah. again. 
it's feeling it but, today. <laughs> but yeah, my social is the first thing. And then I make sure that I'm commenting on it. You know, if someone mm. makes a comment, I play with them. You know, mm. that's that's kind of why I'm here. I'm, I'll play with them. Uh, yes, I get I get people that want to start something. Right. You know, if they're way off base, I, I will delete the post. I don't care. I, I just, you know, boom. You know, why, why is this post even on this comic? You know, so mm-hmm. I'll delete it, you know, just because it doesn't belong there. But right. If someone has an opinion, I want to hear it. And and I get a lot out of that because I'm like, oh, OK, because it helps me see things differently as I step back. Now, it doesn't mean but I just, have to agree with the opinion. Just followed you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I, I might agree with the opinion, but it just gives me a chance to see what someone else has to say. And like when I post a, uh, if I post a cartoon that might have a political slide to it, or a, a, actually my, mine aren't really political, they're most social commentary of how people treat each other, because I, I could care less about politics. I'm more of how do you treat each other as an individual? Mm-hmm. And that to me is far more important because that mm-hmm. would solve a lot of problems that people were just a little bit more um, charitable mm-hmm. or conservative, to, or not conservative, but considerate to each other. Considerate, and, compassionate. And, right. And I think that creates a whole, that, that would solve so many different problems here. But then, and, and usually in those, I'll get it, but I'll make sure that, that when someone's posting their opinion, that I remind whoever posts underneath it that they're allowed to have that opinion. You can't, mm-hmm. you can't make that person feel bad for posting because right. I invited them to post. Mm-hmm. And so they stay what they want, the person underneath. And I will get into those conversations and I'll tell the one guy that's like, oh, I'm right and this is wrong and you know, you're know you going to hell or whatever. And I'll go, look, dude, you're the one giving everything a bad name here. So we will just move you off to the page and then we'll just go on to something <laughs> else. I, I want people to feel that their opinion, wherever it, it, it's at on the spectrum, matters. Mm-hmm. And, and it you... allows... What? Go ahead. No, no, f- finish that thought. But it allows... It allows my fan base to grow because they understand that I am considerate to them. I'm willing to give them a place. And like I said, whether I agree with it or not is is unimportant. What's important is that I treat them like a human being and Mm -hmm. I don't go on the attack. Now, if they attack my family or my faith, then oh, easily I'll defend that without hesitation. But -hmm. everything else is just kind of like, all right, that's that's your opinion. Show me the facts. Let me read up on it myself and I'll figure it out. I'll come up with my own opinion. Mm -hmm. You essentially, uh, you started posting comics online in 1999. Here Mm -hmm. we are in 2022. You've seen the rise and fall of dot coms. You've seen the rise and fall of blogs. You've seen uh, the rise of social media the fall of some social medias <laughs> um now we're in this like landscape where if you don't post a, a reel or you're not on tiktok are you getting the kind of engagement that you should get i'm, I'm curious where you get the most traction today well, and and what seems to be you know working from this long-term perspective because i'm sure I sort of see things like I'm really quick. I sort of see things through. I've been around for a while too, where it's like, yeah, people don't come to blogs, but there's still value in blogging, right? I, I what I see is it's understanding who your audience is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I if you were born between seventy one and seventy seven, you were born in the best era. I, I, I have to put it to you, and I'll explain why in a second. The reason being is, is you played outside. Mm-hmm. Star Wars <laughs> came out for the first time in 77. And I was six years old when I saw Star Wars in a, my pajamas in a beat up station wagon at a drive in. And I can still <laughs> remember seeing Star Wars at six. I remember when Superman flew for the first time and watching Christopher Reeve. Uh, and we played all of that. During the summer, <laughs> all summer long, we were Batman and Robin. We were Superman. We were Luke. Sky- I was always Luke Skywalker because I was blonde. Um, and, you know, we were and, and, and all, the whole neighborhood played. Then in the mid 80s, video games came out. Now, I can remember when my dad got the first Atari and stuff like that. And that was kind of like cool. But by the time the 90s started coming out, RPGs were coming out, the different mm-hmm. kind of games that were a lot more in depth. And I'm from the era of we rolled dice. 
-hmm. And so we played RPG games. So we understand the digital gaming era because we were teens when that came out. But we also understand the value of play. Two unique concepts. Anybody born after a certain point and all they had were the video games era, struggle with play. Anybody mm-hmm. that was born in the 60s struggles with with the um, video Technology. game era. Right. And, and so you <laughs> see this really weird dynamic. So anybody that was in our age group, we got the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Now, understanding our audience is the same thing. Is, is I realize that my audience is people that have been playing games as long as I have um, that love RPGs. And so they are established. They have good jobs and they have money to burn. Mm -hmm. So that's my audience. Now that audience is not into reels. They'll watch reels, but they're not into making them. Right. Now the younger audience, they find it through conventions or Mm -hmm. they might find it through Instagram and they'll follow me through Instagram. Or they might find it, it's like, oh, he plays D&D. Oh, wow. And to them, it's a whole new environment. It's like it was, it's, it, they're the ones that found it. And I'm like, yeah, but I've been playing since 84. <laughs> and before you were even a thought in your mother's eye. I mean, I, you know, so there's a whole unique feel. It's just one generation to another. And so we have this younger generation that's, that's videos. I've got to have it now. I've got to see it. And they, they that's their generation. My generation's a little different. We're like, okay, I can I can just relax and I can just show mm-hmm. a picture and stuff. Now, my generation's going to fade away in 20 years. I already know that. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But I hope by then I have brought up an, their kids because mm-hmm. my generation has grandkids and kids and who are they buying their books for? They're buying mm-hmm. them for those groups who are mm-hmm. just starting to play games. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the really cool thing about Dungeons and Dragons is it created a whole new renaissance of, of game players where they're actually sitting at a table, having an adventure together as a group. And my comics to them, they think it's brand new, but really the same stories were happening, you know, 30 years ago at my table. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> there's this neat connection that happens. Um, I think where reels become really important for the artists, though is and and i would like to do this i have no problem doing this is the actual drawing show Mm -hmm. me that you draw they there's something mesmerizing watching an illustrator draw Mm -hmm. or a painter i find myself when i'm like flipping through instagram and i I go i'm gonna jump on the rails i stop at all the painters Mm because i'm watching them how do you do this why do you do that and i look at what they do and it's gorgeous and they're doing traditional where i'm a digital painter Mm -hmm. so i i use different techniques and yeah. I'm going, well, how can I incorporate that technique into my technique? So I think there's a place for them. Um, and I think that is the future to a degree. But I, I still think that we're going to have all these other platforms where people just like, give me one image. You know, give mm-hmm. me. I see cartoon is starting to, to try and, and adapt and, you know, really bad illustrations, but they make them move and they do this stuff. And, you know, that doesn't do anything for me. I'm mm-hmm. still reading. I find a comic str- on Instagram that I like, and it's just swipe, swipe to the next mm-hmm. panel, swipe to the next panel. And I enjoy that because I like reading it. So, yeah. you know, then I'll buy the book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if they've got a book out, I'll support them and buy the book. So I think reels have their their place, um, just like I think the other aspects of social media have their place. It just depends on what generation is using the platform to keep it going. And mm-hmm. the, the, as the platforms change, you know, the older generation will slowly move on to something else. Right. Do you have a newsletter? Do you use that at all? No, no, I used to, but <laughs> okay. I just, what happened to that? Well, it, It's a time issue, mm-hmm. you know, like I get back today, today I'm kind of off and on, but um, I have to teach a class this evening. So I'll be gone at three 30. Mm-hmm. Um, I told all my where clients, do you, where do you teach uh, RCC? I teach uh, digital applied digital media and, oh, okay. uh, RC, uh, I really enjoy it. It's another stream. And, uh, but uh, for me, like I've got two hours or three hours that I dedicate to life of the party in the morning. And then the rest I'm drawn for clients. I mean, I've got a big job coming up next week that I'm going to be out of town again, which I'm not thrilled about, but I've got to do it. So having a newsletter and stuff like that, when you're a when you're a one man show is really difficult. Where do I find the time? Mm-hmm. So I would rather just post a comic 
And the cool thing about Instagram and some of these platforms is if you post your comic first and then your second image is your selling point, you usually don't get hit by the algorithm. Hmm. I see. Okay. So then, so then I'll, I'll show my image and then the back image is, Hey, if you want the books, go to Amazon. If you want this, go mm -hmm. here. And, right. and that, that keeps it steady. So do you, have you seen a drop in engagement on Instagram? Uh, so the algorithms nailed me about a year and a half ago. Uh -huh. So I was growing like super quick. Um, and I hit about 15,400. Uh, that was my fan base. And then all of a sudden it just came to grind. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I couldn't figure out why. And, uh, I, I just think I got knocked in their algorithm because I look at some of the other comics that are up there and I'm like, these guys must be paying for something because this mm -hmm. comic does not deserve 10,000 hits. <laughs> you know i'm not saying yeah. that yeah well yeah I know. something's I mean, happening there's something wrong with it uh it, what's funny is my facebook fan page for life of the party that's got a fan base of like thirty four thousand, mm -hmm. and that's hitting like the 700 and 800 to a thousand hits you know likes on those comics mm -hmm. so i'm getting more awesome. more feedback through my fan page than i am through anything else and but, do you did you set up that fan page or is that uh -huh. I set everything okay. up? Okay, I'm my own fan page. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> right. But all right, out. Oh, go ahead. Hold on, I got a happy dog today. So that's funny. We all got uh, we got a happy dog here too every once in a while as well. So, but I want to. I want to. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to know for our viewers because a lot of them are younger than us, right? You're 51, I'm 56, Jake is 26, 45. How old are you? 45. I'm 45, and I feel like talking to Travis, like I'm talking to my future self. Like you're saying the <laughs> things to me that I imagine myself <laughs> should be, you know, will be saying to me, like, dude, you know, cut out the, with the Kickstarters. Just go to, <laughs> go to well, yeah. it's, it's just <laughs> learning how to, you got to adapt. That's the whole thing about this industry that even young creators do not realize. They, they jump yeah. in and I was there. I don't know if you were there at one time, Will, but when you jump in and you're like, oh, I want to be an animator for Disney or I want to do this. And you don't realize that being an animator for Disney means you only have maybe three years of solid work and then you're out on looking again for a new job. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know? exactly. no, I, yeah. I, I, I was, I was teaching uh, my students that at, at UVU, I'd, I'd have animators come back, not not broken, but um, disillusioned with the high costs of oh. yeah of of living in California, and you know getting laid off for the third or fourth time, and finally going okay this isn't really working. I'm, I didn't make it high enough to be saved or I don't n have a network of people enough or I'm 2d and everything's going 3d, you know, there's always different reasons, but yeah, adapting is, is huge. So my question is if you were trying to launch your career today, what would your advice be to you starting out right now? It would be the same thing that I'm doing now. You know, the mm -hmm. first thing is, is, you have to ask yourself, how bad do you want it? I've been having this conversation with another artist recently. And I said, how bad do you want it? And then he starts to tell me and I looked at him and I go, I don't believe you. I don't believe anything you're going to tell me. <laughs> if, if you want to make this as a career, then you will figure out a way to make it happen. You have to show me that you're going to willing to put the effort in. Number two is, is what are you willing to give up? Now, you, family, you can't give up. But you look at how much time you spend playing games or binging a show or watching TV or, or, or all of those other things. Preach. That, that's that's going to – you can still listen to those shows and stuff, but they say it takes 10,000 hours to be a master. Well, that's only three and a half hours a day for nine years. <laughs> that's, it. that's totally achievable. And when you break it down like that, the kids are like – Oh, oh, I could do that. I could dedicate three hours a day. Now I dedicate a little bit more than three hours a day to drawing, but, but you know, that's good. The, the next thing I would say is, is learn to create multiple streams because nothing is secure in this world. I don't care what kind of job I was an art director for 15 years, loved it, thought it, you know, thought I was going to stay there forever. I hit a certain point 
though I was working basically two jobs because the freelance work was just as much as the art directing work. And my mm -hmm. boss knew that. My boss did the best thing that he could ever do for me. He laid me off <laughs> because he wanted me to succeed. He knew where I was going to be happy. I took him mm -hmm. out to dinner and, and thanked him many months later because it was the neat thing that I needed. It was the jump that I needed to, to get out here. And, and because of that, it was, it kind of really put me on my path to where I am today. And that was almost 10 years ago. Now, the last thing I would say is the best advice I was ever given was by Pascal Campion. Mm. And Pascal told me, he goes, post something daily. He goes, I don't care what it is. It can be a sketch. It could be a finished drawing. It could be an art piece. Uh, and now Pascal posts a, a fine art piece every single day. It takes him 30 minutes to do those art pieces. That's it. It blows my mind. I know what he's working in too, which even blows my mind anymore. It, he, he was building a lot of that in flash, um, <laughs> which is, is, is just amazing, but he's right. And the minute that I started posting every day and I would use multiple platforms, that's when my career, that's when people came out of the woodworks going, Hey, are you available for a job? Are you available to do this? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say use multiple platforms and post daily is because you never know what art director is looking for artists and where they look. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at Deviant or I'll look at um, uh, Instagram. That's how I find my artists. But then I know that there's other people in some of the forums that I'm at that are game designers and they're looking for artists and the game designers. So having life of the party is like perfect because every day they see a comic and they're like, yeah, that's, that's the guy I want. Now, the, the last thing I will say, and this is the most crucial is is don't focus on fan art for your career um mm. too many artists focus on fan art and prints they think mm -hmm. that's what the market wants and what it is is it's it's short-term game but not sustainability right. and, and what happens you spend your entire career chasing what's the next popular thing and prints unfortunately no one's really buying prints anymore or i'm not I'm looking for, if I'm going to put a piece of art on my wall, it's going to be an original. Mm -hmm. Or um, as I walk up and down the aisles, it's like, all right, I don't need another stitch or I don't need a Deadpool right. or I don't need a Wolverine matchup. What I'm looking for is show me your art book. Give me a book. I'll buy mm -hmm. your art book hands down. And I'm selling more books now than I have ever sold. I mean, people want books uh, and they mm -hmm. want art books and they want stuff like that. So stay away from the fan art. Uh, I also get licensed. It, it, you know, get light. If you're doing fan art, get licensed because I know who's licensed and who's not to a degree. And and I don't buy unlicensed fan art. I try not to. I, I want to support the guys that follow the system. But um, I would say do your own IP. Start now. Create your own IP. Figure out your character and start with that. And build your build your own world and create your own prints. Do your own thing. And it will take longer to get to where you want to go but it is long-term stability. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started, no one would have cared who Bean was. No one would have cared who Life of the Party was. And, you know, 25 years later, that's all I'm known for, or mm -hmm. game art or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they get excited about it. So that was a 25-year journey to get to where I'm at. And the realization is, is I can't stop. I'm going to keep going and go till <laughs> I die. Mm -hmm. um, but... I am in control of everything. I don't ever have to worry about a, a lawyer getting on my case that I'm using someone else's property unless it's an original. I don't mm -hmm. have to deal with any kind of crap. It's just my own thing. I control all my own contracts. And I love having the knowledge that it's mine. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, this is mine. Mm -hmm. It's not someone else's idea. It's all mine. That's, that's, that's the power that, that artists... Yeah, that's, that's, that's the power that artists have that... I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of them don't really understand is that there there are so many uh, people out there that are looking for a product to market that someone else made. But if you're an artist, you're the one that makes the product. Right. That's mm -hmm. something that 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 most people can't do. They can't make something that's original. And, right. and we can, and we can. Oh yeah. All, all it takes is finding a market. Well, and, and if you like doing fan art, keep watching what comes out in public domain. You know, there's a lot of new things that came out. Peter Pan just came into public domain. Um, Wizard of Oz has been in public domain for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. 
Yeah. Winnie the yeah. Pooh just came in. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh just came <laughs> back into public domain. Not Disney's not, Winnie the Pooh, but the original. Not, the original. The you know, now there's a horror movie about it. I mean. Right. <laughs> Blood and honey. Um, so I want to, um, you keep talking about your revenue streams. I want to know what all the revenue streams are. Like, where are you, where are you getting, getting all this? Well, they constantly cash change. From? They constantly <laughs> change. So mm-hmm. you have commissions, okay. you know, and don't, and don't, you know, everyone says I'm low on my commission prices, but I'm not, I'm fine for me where I'm at on my commission prices. Um, I, if I, I would just, how often do you do commissions? Is this like a monthly oh, thing or a, I get it almost weekly sometimes. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Patreon is a stream of income. Patreon's a solid stream of income if you use it right. Mm-hmm. Um, I get uh, Amazon's now a stream of income. Teaching's a stream of income. Game artwork is a stream of income. Children's books are now a stream of income. Life of the party has become a stream of income. The bean is a stream of income. Um, uh do you count the, the going to shows as a stream of income? Conventions, profitable? Co- yeah. co- conventions are a stream of income. And there's also, you've got other clients. You know, I work for, uh, I'm a part of a group called Lytro. And they contact artists with different companies. And, and that's a stream of income. Um, there's uh, small independent creators that are looking for a cover artist or something. Well, that's a stream of income. Uh, I'm doing uh, a, a monster manual set for another company, and they want to do two more after that. So there's streams of income there. Mm-hmm. So and it and it constantly changes. That's you know what people don't realize is a stream of income doesn't always stay the same. What might be really good for a moment, here's a great example: COVID. That knocked out convention stream of income right off the bat. Mm-hmm. And if your total career is focused on convention income, you're not going to survive. Right. Mm-hmm. But I, know, I, f- I know personally know some people that didn't. Yeah. And I found for two years, because I had all this other stream of income, I had more work ever than, than I, well, I actually had more work than I needed. I mean, it was great. It was amazing um, <laughs> on how busy I was. I mean, for me, my world never changed, I, except mm-hmm. for the fact that there were people in my house. <laughs> right. Right. You know, I worked from <laughs> home. We were the same way. Uh, Lee, Will, and I were talking about how it's like uh, everyone's getting like a vacation, and I'm sitting here like, you know, just grinding. And oh, <laughs> I I <laughs> ground all this noise behind me now. <laughs> right, and then I've got one more. I do originals every now and then. I'll draw an original, mm-hmm. and I can sell that original for three times the amount or four times the amount of a regular print. Yeah, you, you yeah. know so. It's it's finding that there are many different ways. Mugs are stream of income or product. You know how mm-hmm. do I? How, and you notice my my streams are a lot, but I'm constantly looking for new streams, and I also will evaluate streams. Does this not really do anything that I want it to do? So all right, I'll push that one away or or yeah. something. And, and you know, here's the other thing that people don't realize: be generous, be willing to give back. You mm-hmm. know. You get all of this work, that's great, but I bet you'll have opportunities to do something for somebody else that is giving back to your community. So, for instance, mm-hmm. I worked on the big band for Kids Need to Read. Mm-hmm. You know, that was one of the charities I like working for. Mm. So, I find different opportunities to give back. And I find that if you get back, the way the universe works is you get more work. Mm-hmm. You know, it <laughs> constantly brings. And that's good. I like that. That's great. Um, also, I would say the last thing on, on, on the, a bit of advice and just that constant reminder is stick to your guns. If you're not going to draw a certain thing or whatever your morals might be, stick to that. And, mm-hmm. and I can remember losing jobs in the very beginning because uh, we had a publisher that wanted me to draw um, dirty cartoons. <laughs> and uh, I said no. And it would have been a pretty solid you know, monthly check. But Mm -hmm. we turned it down. Now I get a script or something from anybody and I never have to worry because they already know the value system that I created over a 25 Mm -hmm. year period. So you can control your career if you choose. 
And that's the key. You have to choose what you're going to control in your career and what you're not. You mentioned um, Latro. Latro, is that how it's? Lytro. Lytro. Yeah, L-A-E. Oh, I forgot how it's spelled. L-E-E-O-T-R-O or something like that. What is that? How does it it's, work? It's just a group of artists and creators that that um, kind of get together and and uh, they have also people that aren't artists and they'll find it's like a uh, I, I kind of say it's almost like an art agency mm-hmm. and they connect you with different clients and you can choose to take the client or not. Mm-hmm. And so I enjoy it. They control all the pricing and everything else and, and I can pick the job I want and they take care of me for what I need and you know, I mean, it's not steady, steady, constant work, but it's enough to go, hey, we got a big job coming up. You want to do it? All right, sure. I'll take it, take it on. So it's it's a good avenue. I mean, the, the, I guess the key is, is, is just, you know, getting out there and showcasing mm-hmm. your work. They found me online. Mm-hmm. They also found me through an invitation by someone else going, hey, you need to check out so-and-so. I mean, we pass people's names all the time in this community, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I mean, I don't know how many people I sent over to Wills that wanted like baby stuff for their kid. <laughs> I mean, we still have the Jack Skellington, you know, oh, cool. onesies. <laughs> the, but, um, I, I got on their email list and uh, I get the emails, but I forgot what it was. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I was, I need to like give the, I'm just been so busy doing the podcast and SVS Learn and my own Kickstarter and everything that was like, what you know one more thing is just like gonna completely break my break the camel's back well, right and that's and that's where balance is needed you know right. how do you create balance and i mean we all go through it i almost had a nervous breakdown about eight years ago um, and and it was because my priorities were screwed up and mm-hmm. i had to sit down and write out what my priorities actually were and then i realized what they were i had to put god first and i had to put mm-hmm. my wife second and then my kids were third, and then service was fourth, and then my health and work was last. And I realized mm-hmm. when my priorities were in that order, and everything functioned. I always had work. But the minute I let work creep up and it would take over, everything would fall apart because I would be like, well, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. Or I got to do this. I got to, I don't have time to go to this family function or I don't have time to be here. And now mm-hmm. work is totally taking over my life. Life, or I can't serve or I can't do this. And mm-hmm. that's when I realized I had to move work to the very end and mm-hmm. work comes, but I, you know, people come into my office all the time and I go, Hey, can we talk? Yeah. You know, you, I'll break away for you. I mean, it means mm-hmm. that I got to work a little later at night, but it's worth it. Mm-hmm. Well, you Jake has seriously misplaced priorities. So you need to take a lesson from this, Jake. <laughs> <I'm taking laughs> serious notes. I got notes on here about everything everything this guy's saying um so going back to the priorities was kind of like the next thing i was curious about um what's a weekly schedule look like for you well without conventions Mm -hmm. it's functional (laughs) (laughs) no wait a week for me is like monday through friday um Mm -hmm. i teach an early morning church class so i Mm -hmm. get up and teach that and then i uh i take my kid to school And then I draw for me for about two hours. I I draw a life of the party. Mm -hmm. And then I start client work till about six. Uh, I Mm -hmm. make sure there's a lunch in there. Usually I'll take a quick nap during that time, like a 30 minute nap to keep me going. Then everybody comes home about 536. So I'm there for dinner. Um, If I feel the need, I'll start work again at seven, work till about 839. And then Mm -hmm. I go to bed. And then my weekends are almost the same. You know, mm-hmm. my Monday morning or my Saturday is, is I'll work for a couple of hours. And after one o'clock, it's family time. And mm-hmm. then Sundays, I don't work at all. I just take the whole day off. Yeah. I, I need that. I need that rest. I actually do. You know, the older I get, the more I realize how great a nap is. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I missed a meeting with Will and Lee the other day because I was asleep. Totally. <laughs> it was very atypical. And we're in there and uh, Preston's going, um, where's Jake? And we're like, I don't know. I'm usually one like, guys, we got a meeting. We got a meeting. <laughs> and this time I'm like, oh, you guys started. Okay, good. <laughs> um, th- no, this is this has been really, really cool. I like that you're, um, you know, the priorities are right. But then it seems like daily 
you're not doing client work first. You're doing your own work first. So you're getting like the freshest version of you um, mm -hmm. when you're in that art period in that morning time, right? Well, is that I, is that I, deliberate? I, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to. So if you want to work on your own projects, you have to create time for you to do that. Mm -hmm. And you have to dedicate yourself to that time. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I can get four or five comics drawn and then in a two hour period and then I can ink or color them later. And, and that allows a, me those four to five comics. That's a daily post. So, so yeah, that will be a daily post. So that's four or five days worth of comics that are ready to go. So I try to be like a newspaper. I try to be four or five weeks ahead. Yeah. But I find that giving yourself that time is is if you want to do anything for you. You know, you need to give yourself the, the ability to do it. Now, the thing that you have to watch out for, though, is if you allow yourself to get into work time, you know, client time, then you've got to be willing to to stay up a little bit later to finish the client work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be important as well. Because you got to so, deliver. Yeah, you have to deliver. you got to follow through with what you say. And I've got really great clients. They allow me to, to do what I need to do and get things done when I can get them done because they know I travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. but um, you definitely, you know, I make sure that there's my time to, to do my, my ideas and my stuff. Now I always keep a pad of paper next to me or a, I have several sketchbooks and I'll draw in them uh, as I'm working through the day because I get ideas all during the day. There'll be something mm -hmm. that someone says, or might be a, you know, a post that someone sends me or a story that, Oh, I like that. You know, and then I'll write that down. Um, so I kind of keep that, that moving. Now, the last three weeks I've been on the road 90% of the time. So it's really wrecked my schedule. So today mm -hmm. I'll rest a little bit more and then I get back into my routine tomorrow. It, I'll just jump right back in. Can, can I ask you, how do you fit cons into this sort of structure that you have going on? How many cons do you do a year? About between, um, I used to do like 15 to 16, but now mm -hmm. I'm doing about nine. Okay. And the structure is easy because most shows don't change their dates or they're in the same week period. So I have an idea of what months are going to be con months and what not are not. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. year was a little different because everybody was just trying to get back. So they threw a really big show in August that I wasn't expecting, which made me so I couldn't do another show. And then another show moved from November and they moved into September, which was the same weekend as Dragon. Mm. And, and, you know, so this month was, or this year was just a little problematic, but next year, everybody seems to fall back into their normal places. So I can plan jobs around conventions. So it's like, okay. Yeah. I, I, and as long as you're upfront with your clients, they know what's going on. I'll say, Hey, look, I'm leaving right now for this. I'm going to be gone for five days. Now I can do some work, but I can't do a lot of work because I'm working at the show. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other guys like Kunkel too. Uh, Mike Kunkel, great example. You know, he's, he's in charge of a, uh, an animated feature. And so he's got to spend most of his evening, you know, going out and signing stuff off. And, and that goes back to what are you willing to go up and give up? Mm -hmm. So we both decided, you know, well, I'm giving up dinner, uh, you know, with a <laughs> bunch of friends or I'm going to give up because you're on the floor for 10 hours or 12 oh my hours. Gosh. Yeah. And so, and then everybody's like, well, let's go out to dinner or let's do this. I'm like, no, dude, I'm going back to my hotel and I'm going to sleep. I'm, I'm going to draw. I need to, you know, I, I try to stay with family. So I'm not near the convention hall. So I get a break yeah. from that chaos. And so, you, and I've been doing shows for 20 years. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. So, you know, and I, I don't have any plans to stop because I enjoy them, but I, I got a lot of friends that are now finally getting out because they're just getting tired. You know, they're worn out. And this year wore a lot of us out. I think it really did. Yeah. How do you see so you, you? A con is five days, you said. Um, it depends on driving? the show. Some are three. Are uh, you driving can, to these or are you flying? or? If I can drive to them, I'll drive to them. So my okay. longest drive is Seattle. And I know it's mm -hmm. going to take two days up and two days back. Well, while I'm mm -hmm. driving to Seattle, I'm working on book ideas. I dictate the whole time. <laughs> okay. So you, I actually turn the radio off. For me, it does. I turn the radio off and I start talking, you know, and I just fill up my phone with <laughs> ideas in the notes section. Now, I do realize I have to go back and clean that up because dictation sucks. But 
<laughs> you know, uh, but I use I use that time for me, or I'll stop and um, I'll go check some stuff out. I, I'll take a slower trip up. Uh, yeah. uh, I'll use it to visit kids. So, uh -huh. like after Salt Lake s Saturday night, I drove up to Idaho and I spent two days with my my yeah. grandkids, which was great. Um, I just coming home yesterday sucked because it was yeah. just unexpected. Um, you know, so some shows take four hours to get to. You can get to them really easy. Some shows are going to take two days to get to. Mm -hmm. um, I do fly. So like if it's an East Coast show, I got to fly to it. And the thing that, that sucks about that is I can't bring all my gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just, how do you set up for a, for an East Coast show? Uh, if I've got someone in the neighborhood, I send my stuff to them. I mm -hmm. fly out there, rent a car, oh, wow. and then I'll drive up with that stuff. And I'll bring people along, you know. I've got mm -hmm. fans that now work for me at different times or different shows. They, I say, hey, I'll cover your food. I'll get you in. I just need mm -hmm. help basically with load in, load out, and making sure I eat during the day and, and mm -hmm. help me stay functional. So, you know, you get to kind of get a vibe on people, and mm -hmm. you just sound like invite them to the party. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find with cons, uh, it sounds like you're prolific enough that every time you go to a show, there's something new on the table. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There has to be. Is, is that the key essentially to having a success, a successful con? Well, so a successful con varies on, on several factors. Okay. The first factor is how long have you been doing the show and how well are you known? Mm -hmm. So if you do a show for the first time and nobody knows you in the area, you might make a decent amount of sales. You'll probably break even. You'll do good. Um, but if you've done that show for six years, now everybody knows where you're at or they know that you're going to be there. So you now you're definitely going to make well, as mm -hmm. long as you have new product on your table. Mm -hmm. And that's the key is, is how do I get new product? Now, prints, prints are tough because people are running out of wall space. They're like, well, I can't put the print up. I don't want to buy any more prints. Mm -hmm. But books are different or games because it's a tangible item that they can put in a bookshelf or they can put on a coffee table or they've got a game because their kids or their grandkids are growing up and now they can play. And so that's a whole different avenue. So which is one of the reasons why we went to KDP was now I had I had 10 new books, seven through KDP and three through other publishers that were on my table this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's we would amazing. go. <laughs> and we would come home empty. So my goal next year is to have at least four or five new books starting in March. Right. Wow. And 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 by keeping that rhythm, um, it will always people will come back. Well, what what don't I have? Or I bought the first two books. Now I can buy the next two books. Oh, you got new books out. Okay, we'll get those next time. So you've got to have new stuff on your table. Um, this is where I go. You know. IPs are uh, make sure they're your IPs. If you want mm -hmm. longer stability, make sure it's your IP. Work on that. Work on merchandising. You know, add mugs, add shirts or something. You just how do I get creative at my table? Mm -hmm. um, if you focus solely on someone else's IP, sooner or later that that dries up, right. and you just have to move on. Right. Uh, the other thing is 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 make it look nice. Get out of Artist Alley. The minute mm -hmm. I left Artist Alley, my sales increased sixty percent. Because <laughs> I was no longer competing against the two artists on the side of me and the three artists in front of me. Right. Because what happens is people walk by, they'll buy from the guy next to you, but because they just bought from the guy next to you, they don't want to buy from you, so they'll skip you and they'll keep moving mm -hmm. down. Right. But yep. when you get a corner or you get an inline or something and you're on the main floor as an exhibitor, your competition is toys and your competition is you know Back clothing and, <laughs> and stuff like that so you stand out as an artist and people uh, go, oh who are you you know and and so that opens up a lot of of real estate uh the other thing is is corners are the best because you get the most real estate out of a corner yep. mm -hmm. you know and you got to look at what you're putting on your table some people you know they throw whatever is on their table i got stickers but if stickers are covering you know 20 percent of your table that's not effective placement on on your other merchandise that might have a bigger price point. So you want your yeah. bigger price point out so more people can see it than your My thing price. is don't do stickers. They they don't pay for themselves. Some people will definitely uh, take issue with that, but like I mean, you make a print, it costs you a dollar, you sell it for 20 or 30. dollars You cannot 
compete with that with the sticker. The sticker's going to cost you a dollar or two, and you can sell it for five bucks. Well, then you run into the issue that people are like, oh, I don't have to spend $30 on you. Now I can just spend five. Mm. Right. That's the other thing. You cannibalize your sales with your own product. Mm-hmm. You're competing mm-hmm. with yourself. Yep. I try to keep my price point between 50 and 15 and 30. Yeah. So, so that allows it to just, you know, everything. Your, your sticker's way. better off as a, hey, buy a print and get a free sticker. Well, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then you find out people find trends. So I can mm-hmm. remember when buttons were a trend. And then... Mm-hmm these guys would show up at a convention and they would have like six presses and they're cutting comics and making buttons and they're mm-hmm. selling them for cheap. And they just totally flooded the button market, just totally destroyed it. Yeah. Then you've got, um, stickers did the same thing. They came out, everybody was doing stickers. People are still doing stickers right now. Enamel pins are the hot item. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So it's just like, everyone's trying to jump on what's the next popular thing. What's funny is I always go back to books because books always sell Mm -hmm. regardless of where I'm at. Always. And it's hard to make a book. So you have less competition, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's, I'm not going to say it's harder to make a book. They just don't know where to look. (laughs) They don't know what resources are available. I I don't mean it's hard to get a book printed. It's hard to, to But that's what I'm saying. Because their mindset's different. Their mindset is like, I got to make a buck. I got to pay my table. I got to get this. So I'm going to try to get whatever I can out at the moment. Well, that's not the right way to look at it. You need to really kind of go, what's my long-term goal? Mm -hmm. You know, and I I was talking to this other artist, this young guy, and and he said that his long-term goal was to create a book that would be totally different than anything else anybody says, has seen. You know, Mm -hmm. it was going to change the world of comics. And I said, that's not a long-term goal. I go, what happens when you're done with that book? And he's like, I don't know. I go, you've created <laughs> nothing for you to keep moving on. And okay. once you realize that that book doesn't move, mm-hmm. then you're going to get depressed and frustrated and leave the business. I said, you got to look beyond that. That's why I look at myself as an illustrator, because I'm going to create multiple stories. I'm going to create multiple mm-hmm. books. I'm going to just do what I want to do. So I'm never locked into one book. I'm always working on the new project. I've always got something else coming down the pipeline. Yeah. The other thing is, is when you're writing a book or you're creating your own IP, um, I, I listen to people and they go, yeah, I'm going to write an IP that changes the world, or I'm going to do something that's eco, you know, eco-friendly, or I'm going to do, you know, we're going to do this cause here or whatever. Well, that's great. The issue is, though, is if you're writing for a cause or to change something or whatever, those books don't sell. They, they just don't. They have a niche mm-hmm. audience, and that's about it. You can't get them to it, – it's really hard to get them out into the world. I, I tell people, look at that 13 to 15-year-old self that you used to be, and you write the book that that 13 or 15-year-old was going to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those are the best stories. Yeah. You know? And you could, you could put your – uh the, you put the your message you in. believe in you put uh-huh. your message in there S- sneak it in <laughs> well you're not even just sneaking in it just goes in naturally right, but right write the book that you would have read as a 13 or 15 year old right, right. create the art that you would put up in your room mm-hmm. and yeah. and not the art that you think somebody wants to put up in their room because more than likely they don't and if you mm-hmm. do that their your audience will find you they 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 come they, they you will find that there's an audience out there for anything that you do yeah, that's that's awesome. So you working at this for for twenty plus years. When you launch a book, how many books can you expect to sell? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because it changes all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know. Um, if I so when I launched the first book of Life of the Party, we had really incredible high sales. Boom! It just yeah. went really good. When I launched the seventh one, because I had done it in such a short time, I flooded my own market. Mm -hmm. I knew what I was doing because I wanted all seven books for the shows, but I hurt my online sales because of it. Mm -hmm. I should have spread it out like every three months, lots of new book. But Mm -hmm. I get my my issue is, is I get angsty and I'm like, I got to get this out now. It's like I I I don't want to wait. I just want to get it out and just see what happens. Yeah. Um, I don't worry about how well a launch does or anything else. Uh, that's not, in, I mean, it's important, but it's not important. I worry about it's out. Now I can start getting it to show so people can see it mm-hmm. and, and go from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
In fact, I'm going to start a whole new line of children's books, and I'm curious to see how that's going to go. And these are self-published um, yeah. sort of thing. Going, okay. Yeah, I'd rather self-publish than go through a major publisher. It, it's interesting how self-publishing used to have a stigma attached, and now it's it's quickly going away. It does in some circles, but um, there's a lot of smart creators that are making mm-hmm. a really good living. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You, you, can, you can do very, very well in self-publishing if you want to. Yeah, the books that you you said the bean is being published by a publisher. Yeah, well, who's so? The, uh, Outland is publishing Bean, but uh-huh. I've known I've known Jeremy over at Outland who owns it for twenty mm-hmm. some years, and we set up a very good contract um, mm-hmm. for it to be done, and he really wanted to do it, um, which helped me because I was kind of tired of it. Yeah. Um, so but if not now, for that, you wouldn't have gone. Right, the right. But now that that they're involved and they're making things work and stuff like that, it's kind of inspired me to get back into it. Mm-hmm. So That's sometimes cool. having someone, a publisher, helps you stay focused. Can I ask, of these revenue streams, book publishing, freelance work, commissions, cons, all that stuff, um, what, you know, there's sort of like this long tail, like you get, a, a, a certain amount from a certain revenue stream where you're at right now in 2022, what's like the top revenue stream and what's like the bottom, like the I, diminishing returns. I have no idea. I'd actually, I, okay. I kind of figure that out when I get ready to do my taxes. Tax time. Time. You're <laughs> like, Whoa, we did way better in can, this than I thought. Can we oh. see your taxes? No, you cannot. <laughs> no. No, okay. the, the issue that I think that you run into like conventions, you can go, Oh, well, that's a great revenue stream, but people don't realize how much money goes into conventions as well. There's a mm-hmm. lot of money that we pay to do that. Publishing. And you have money sitting out there for a year a lot of people don't realize that that Mm -hmm. you have to renew your next show at the show to get the discount so you've got money sitting in every city that you go and do a show at exactly and then you're gonna wait a year to use that money and then you've got to pay again so the only way to really cash out of the shows is to stop doing it yeah and i I choose (laughs) not to you know I, i mean i do well enough now that that yeah i i I cover all my costs. And the goal is if you're doing conventions, you just cover your costs so you can do it again. Mm-hmm. You know, if that's what you like, you know, keep covering yeah. your costs. When you're dealing with publishing, you gotta remember there's a publishing cost. You know, even mm-hmm. though I use KDP, if I still want books on my table, I gotta buy the books. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna spend money there. Yeah. You know, there's constant areas where you spend money. Mugs, I gotta buy product. But mugs, mm-hmm. you know, I, I look at it as long as the return is at least one and a half. Mm-hmm in my favor and then i will do the product mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm. like a mug or something i'll get you know i got my cost but i've got to make at least one and a half more over that mug to make it right. worthwhile same with a book mm-hmm. i got to make at least a book and a half um mm-hmm. and, it, and it's not like i'm trying to 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 be greedy and stuff it's just that's how i have to do it to survive right and, it's and, business and, and that's what it is unfortunately you know you have to think about what business is. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a this is a job. It's a career. This is not mm-hmm. a hobby. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people treat, oh, this is my hobby. This is my mm-hmm. secondary. And because they treat it that way, they never go anywhere. Mm-hmm. But the minute you're willing to treat it like an actual business, then it becomes a very realistic um, that has expenses, that has returns, that has you know all these different features to it. Cool. Well, I, I mean, I feel like I could ask a hundred more questions, but I'll come back on. <laughs> I, I think I just want to have you as a consultant. For me. Yeah, you're you're a pro, Travis. I knew this was going to be a good interview. You, it was you've good. Done it long enough, and um, but I'll save some of these comments for after you leave because we want to talk about you. Yeah. Oh. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Is there any but, anything? closing you wanted to say before we let you go uh i feel like you you just would, it's been a a, a a steady drip of wisdom this whole time <laughs> i would say is is you know if you've got a, a story idea or a dream or whatever the only person that stops you from doing it is you mm. you're the one that stops you no one else does no one else ruins your life you're the one that mm-hmm. makes the decisions and the choices that that gets you to where you need to be and you 
you know, and in this industry, if, once you start to realize that I can do it, you just got to keep at it, keep walking forward and realize that every other artist is doing the exact same thing. They just are at a different point on the road. Don't compare yourself to them. Just be you. And you'll find that audience. You'll find that, that group that'll support you. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, be humble about it. You know, I'm very grateful for those that are there for me. I'm very grateful for my fan base. I treat them like people. I don't treat them like fans. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a major difference. Um, we're in an industry that people have unprecedented access to creators. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 years ago, you could hide behind a table and no one would know who you are. Now, everybody can, has, can say something to you reach out to you whatever it might be it's nothing like it was and so just be mindful of that one thing that you do or action or thing that you say can destroy your entire career in a moment you'll have to rebuild it from scratch mm -hmm. so you just have to work smartly all right we just finished with travis that was that was really cool i felt like i said it in the interview but i felt like i was talking to a version of myself who'd been you know who who's like yeah wanting to like uh wake me up and tell me this is how you got to do things this is where you need to like tighten up um so yeah. i i really appreciate that he's a he's, he's a cool guy yeah he really is and he's worked so hard and he continues to work hard his work ethic is crazy right at 51 right <laughs> yeah <laughs> He didn't move into a retirement he, community is what he, what he didn't do. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel but, like that was a jab. <laughs> it, listen, you're living your best life, Will Terry. You're living your best life. You, you're still, you, you got, you have so much balance, which is, which is <laughs> making me jealous some days. That's for sure. <laughs> no, but uh, again, I just want to, uh, remind people they can go to beanleafpress.com to see his website, learn more about him. Go to Travis J. Hansen on uh, on Instagram. Follow him there. He's on Facebook, as he said. He's on Twitter. You just Google him and you, you'll you'll figure out where, where you can see him. I also would just want to close too uh, and remind people that we do have a Patreon now for the uh, for the podcast. We've got a bunch of people signed up there. They're getting. Um, our Q and A live streams that are a fun time for everybody. They're getting um, episodes that we don't release publicly, uh, um, sort of private premium episodes. They're getting pro tips that um, that we're sharing with people, kind of like a, how we work in our studio. So if you want a little bit more, you want to support SVS, you want a little bit more uh, insight into the world of illustration, you must go to patreon.com slash three the number three point perspective and sign up there all right thanks for joining us three point perspective is made possible by our patreon and also svslearn.com where becoming a great illustrator starts your hosts are will terry lee white and jake parker will terry can be found at willterry.com lee white and lee white illustration.com and i can be found at mrjakeparker.com podcast produced by daniel two that's daniel tu.co Special thanks to Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Show Notes Wrangler, Lily, Wrangler, <laughs> Lily Howell, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott, and lastly, you. Now, go draw something. <laughs>